How can we move towards a less artificial intelligence and create models that are realistic and also capable of performing cognitive functions? So by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to explain the motivation for building brain realism into AI type models. You'll be able to identify which aspects of a model are under our control when training a network to perform a task. You'll be able to implement features of brain connectivity in a trained recurrent neural network. You'll know how to penalize networks for non-brain-like solutions to performing tasks. You'll be able to identify unrealistic features of learning in neural networks, and you'll learn about some proposed alternatives. So AI type models are really designed for performance. Uh, the goal is to learn to classify images or translate some text as well as possible and it doesn't really matter for the ai engineers whether the solution is something similar to how the brain performs that task or something completely different as we've seen in many of the other videos these models are often inspired by the brain but they have many biological details removed or simplified and so many of these models excel at real world applications but if we're interested in understanding how the brain works, it's often not clear how to make testable predictions using these models to advance neuroscience and our understanding of the brain. So in contrast to the AI type models, uh, there's another tradition in computational neuroscience of more biologically realistic neural network models. Here, for example, we see the example of a circuit with a thousand of spiking neurons and this circuit is capable of performing this simple perceptual decision making task where it has to decide whether these dots are moving to the left or to the right the structure of this network is that there are two separate groups of excitatory neurons some that prefer the left direction and some that prefer the right direction and they both get input in such a way that if the dots are moving to the left they excite these groups of neurons to the left more and if dots are moving to the right uh, that excites this group of neurons that prefer the right more and these different populations of cells that prefer the left and the right they compete with each other via a group of inhibitory neurons that are here called interneurons a key feature of these biologically realistic neural network models is that the their parameters are set based on real neural data, and they're usually fixed. So that differs from the uh, other models that we've been studying, where the parameters are learned from the data. These biologically realistic models vary in the level of biological detail, but more details tend to be kept compared to the AI type models. And the goal of these models is to make directly testable predictions for experiments that can help us rule out certain hypotheses for how the brain works and come up with perhaps a reasonable model of how the brain performs particular tasks. Uh, however, these types of models are usually incapable of complex functions and uh, are not appropriate for real world applications. And uh, there's many differences in terms of the complexity. There can be thousands of spiking neurons, uh, they, but they can also be simplified to a small number of equations. For example, one describing the average activity of a whole population or whole group of these cells that prefers the same type of stimulus. And these models, even though they're quite simple, they do have retain some key elements of the biology, such as their connectivity or some of the elements related to the time scale that allow them to make some quite precise predictions for experiments. So can we attempt to bridge the gap between these two modeling traditions? Can we somehow create models that are capable of more complex perceptual cognitive motor functions, but also are capable of making directly testable predictions for experiments and help us to understand how the brain performs these complex functions. So you can pause and have a quick think about how this may be possible. So I think a very helpful framework for thinking about how to adapt AI type models to be more useful for neuroscience research was proposed a few years ago by a group of international researchers. And so what is under our control? Well, the architecture that we're going to use, so for example, are we going to use a fully connected recurrent neural network or a feed-forward network, how many layers are we going to use, etc. Uh, the cost function, 
is usually under our control, as well as the learning rule. And they've, I think more recently since this paper has come out, uh, there's been more emphasis that actually the training data that we use to train our network is also under our control and can actually really be quite important for the performance of these networks. But here we're going to focus on these three that were suggested in the original paper. So let's start with the architecture. So in AI, usually you choose an architecture that can best solve the problem. Uh, so however, in neuro AI, we want to choose an architecture that can best solve the problem with pieces that are connected with each other in something that resembles, at least in some degree, the brain. So here we can see the architecture of a cortical area. We can see many different types, dozens of types of inhibitory neurons in a single area of the mouse brain. And this was quantified in a connectivity matrix in this paper by Jan and colleagues in 2015. Each column represents a cell, a cell type, a type of neuron that sends out a connection to all of these other cell types. And each row represents a neuron type that receives a connection. And here they've quantified the connection probability. And this is displayed in the color and also in the size of the square. So we see that certain cell types are connected to essentially all other types. So whereas others have very sparse connectivity and they're only connected to a few other cell types. So what do you notice about this connectivity? So you can pause the video and have a little think about this. So I think one important aspect of this connectivity structure is that in contrast to most neural networks and most recurrent neural networks in AI, this is actually quite sparse. You can see that there are certain sections of the matrix that have no connections, essentially a zero probability of a connection. How can we go about imposing a brain-like sparsity like this in a, an artificial neural network? So Francis Song and colleagues in 2016 proposed the following method. So that we start with a fully connected recurrent neural network. Here again, like in the uh, real brain connectivity matrix, the columns represent the connections from neurons and the rows represent the connections to neurons. And in this case, the network is fully connected and all of these weights are trainable, can be learned by gradient descent. Song and colleagues suggested that we can impose sparsity on this connectivity matrix using an element-wise product uh, of a binary mask with this fully connected weight matrix. And the element-wise product is also known as the Hadamard product. So this mask is, is exactly the same size as the full connectivity matrix, and there is a one uh, for all. There is a one for all of the connections that you want to allow the network to learn. And there's a zero for all of the connections that should not exist and the network will not be allowed to learn. And this combination leaves us with a network that matches the desired sparsity that we want. And so one possibility would be to take a real connectivity matrix like the one we saw on the previous slide and use that connectivity matrix to set the sparsity of the network and to learn all the weights between uh, neuron types that really exist in the brain. So another important aspect of the real brain connectivity is Dale's law, which we covered in a previous video. So try to remember what is Dale's law and pause the video if necessary. So we previously saw that Dale's law suggests that a neuron releases the same neurotransmitter at all its outgoing synapses. So an excitatory neuron will send a spike up its axon and it will release the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. This will then connect to this postsynaptic neuron and this will make this postsynaptic neuron more likely to spike. In contrast, an inhibitory neuron will send a spike down its axon. It will release the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA and that will make the postsynaptic neuron it's connected to less likely to spike. So here again, we see this real connectivity matrix of an area of the mouse brain. And we focused on the sparsity previously, but this also has excitatory neurons shown here in the red boxes, as well as inhibitory neurons in all of the other rows and columns. So how can we implement these excitatory and inhibitory cell types in a recurrent neural network? So one way, again proposed by Sang and colleagues, 
is to start with a recurrent neural network, which can have any kind of weights. Then to rectify the weights, which means that after each learning step, you set any weights that are below zero to zero, and you leave any positive weights as they are. So this is just a ReLU function, a rectified linear function on the weights. Then in step two, after you've made all of the weights positive, or at least non-negative, you multiply this first matrix by a diagonal matrix, which has a one in the column representing each of the excitatory neurons, and a minus one in the columns of all of the inhibitory neurons. And so this is a regular matrix multiplication now, not an element-wise product. And the final matrix ends up being as desired, so that the excitatory neurons have positive weights and the inhibitory neurons have negative weights for all connections that exist. So what happens if you train a network with excitatory and inhibitory cells to learn to perform a cognitive task? So, so here again we see the perceptual decision-making task, uh, that a biologically realistic network that was set up to perform this task was able to do and make some interesting predictions for. And the particular form of the biologically realistic network that was able to perform this task had these separated competing excitatory populations that competed via these inhibitory neurons. So in this trained neural network with separated excitatory and inhibitory neurons, this is from uh, Guan Yu, Robert Yang, and Xiao Jing Wang, uh, interestingly, they found that this trained neural network came up with a solution that was very similar to this biologically realistic network. And here we see the strength of uh, connections between excitatory cells shown in blue scale here and the strength of connections from inhibitory cells shown in the red scale. And what we see is this excitatory cells that like the left direction they mostly excite each other quite strongly um, and excitatory cells that prefer the right direction uh, excite each other quite strongly. However they compete via these uh, inhibitory neurons. Uh, in particular, we see these inhibitory neurons on the left inhibit this uh, right preferring population of excitatory neurons and vice versa. So, how do we know if this has anything to do with the brain? Well, in a remarkable series of experiments uh, recently, quantum colleagues trained rats to perform a perceptual decision making task that was related to this. They were able to image the activity of individual neurons within a little piece of the brain that they thought might be involved in this task. And they saw the calcium activity, a readout of the neural activity, uh, across time in these cells in the mouse cortex. After the end of the experiment, they killed the mice and they uh, sliced up the brain and into extremely fine slices. And they put the slices of the brain on an electron microscope and they were able to get down to a bit two nanometers resolution and this allowed them to pick out the cell bodies and the axons and the dendrites of all of these neurons within this little block of brain tissue and they were able to find exactly the same neurons that they had imaged during the performance of the task and using this combination of techniques they are able to reconstruct the real connectivity between these neurons that were active during the task in the brain. And they found a structure of connectivity that was actually really quite similar to that seen in the computational models. So this suggests that by imposing biologically motivated restrictions on recurrent neural network connectivity, it can lead these neural networks to come up with some brain-like solutions to the problems. So although this is, I think, an incredible confluence of modeling, AI, and neuroscience, it is still a relatively simple task. In fact, this is something that we can do quite automatically and very easily. So what about more challenging cognitive tasks? Uh, UA Liu and colleagues wanted to try and understand how the brain might perform something like the Wisconsin card sorting test. And this is a task where people, or sometimes animals, are given one card, and it has a particular shape and a color. Uh, here, for example, a triangle that's blue. And then they're given three other cards that are potential matches to this card. And the match can either be on shape or on color. 
and the correct answer depends on the rule and the rule is hidden and it changes randomly on different blocks and so people have to update their behavior and realize when the rule has changed so on this example if the first card was a blue triangle and the person selects the red triangle instead of the blue circle uh, they they that's a correct response if the appropriate rule was to match the shape however if the appropriate rule was to match the color this would be an incorrect response and they should have instead selected the blue circle so in order to learn this task in a biologically inspired artificial neural network Liu and colleagues uh, connected two separate areas one that was meant to represent a sensory motor area and the other a prefrontal cortex and in each area they connected multiple different types of inhibitory cell types and one excitatory neuron type and this excitatory neuron had both a cell body and a separate dendrite so now we're starting to go from the quite abstract neural networks to networks that that implement quite a lot more features of real biology one trick that they used here was to say that okay uh, we'll use this sparse network according to how we know these different cell types are connected to each other in real biology will only allow certain connections and we won't allow connections that don't exist and we'll also say that all of these synaptic connections that do exist can be learned but the connection between the dendrite and the cell body that's going to be fixed so we'll say that these weights here uh, can represent the connection between the dendrite and the cell body they exist but they're not trainable they are fixed so again we have the trainable weights we have the mask that sets the specific patterns of possible connections for each cell type and we have the fixed weights from the dendrites to the cell body and this network was able to successfully perform this complex cognitive task the, this wisconsin card sorting task and they found that this inhibition of this cell type called SST to the dendrite enables the separation of activity in the network for the different rule. And this allows this network to quickly switch back and forth between different rules when performing the task. Here we can see an example where adding in more details of the biology allows us to actually to get closer to understanding the brain mechanisms of a complex cognitive task. So please turn to Blackboard and answer the following quiz question. What is Dale's law? And how can Dale's law be enforced on a recurrent neural network in which each unit uses the ReLU activation function? So now let's move on from the architecture to the cost function the next aspect of the neural network that's under our control. So normally with an AI approach, you would choose a cost function to minimize the error in the task across the training set that hopefully will also generalize to low error in some sort of real life or test situation. Uh, so with neuro AI, in contrast, we choose a cost function to minimize the error in the task across the training set, uh, but we also penalize the network for solutions that are not brain-like. So one example of this, we can also, instead of using a mask to fix the architecture like we saw previously, we can use a cost function to implement a type of sparsity. So now instead of enforcing some connections to be zero, we can train the network so that it has the usual cost function that penalizes poor performance on the task, but we can also add a penalty for large weights and in particular if you use what's called an l1 norm which is uh, the sum of the absolute values of the weights this will tend to find solutions that have a lot of exactly zero weights so this uh, so this full cost function in this case has two parts the regular task cost to penalize poor performance and the sparsity constraint which adds a penalty for weights this beta term here uh, allows us to say how relatively important it is for us to do well on the task compared to uh, penalizing the weights. And using the absolute value here encourages weights to be sent to zero. And all of this together gives us the total cost, which penalizes poor performance and dense weights.
and this is known as the award regularization of weights. We can also use the cost function to try and get more realistic firing rates. So we can see here the example, uh, the log scale of firing rates in monkeys on different tasks and mice. And we see that a lot of neurons have low firing rates. This is 10 to the zero, so this is about one hertz or one spike per second. And we can see that most of the neurons seem to be in this range of between 0.1 spikes per second up to about 10 spikes per second. But a regular neural network has no way of preferring firing rates in this kind of range. Uh, so how can we discourage recurrent neural networks from using unrealistically higher firing rates? One method is to add another term to the cost function. So again here we start with the regular task cost that penalizes poor performance. And we add an activity constraint that adds a penalty for high activity in the neurons. Again, this beta term here allows us to say uh, how relatively important it is for us to have low firing rates compared to good task performance. And using this uh, square discourages large activities, usually without setting them to zero. And all this together is the total cost in this case. This type of regularization with the square is known as L2 regularization in this case of the firing rates. We can also use regularizers in the cost function to encourage certain types of connectivity structures. So as a reminder to a previous video, uh, where are the recurrent connections in the brain? And in fact, most connections in the cortex are local. They're from within the same brain area and they travel a relatively small distance. Here we can see the number of neural connections within half a millimeter goes down and it's much lower as you get over one millimeter away. So most connections are local and they're between nearby neurons. So how can we discourage recurrent neural networks from relying too much on long distance connections? Putting one idea is to start by embedding these neurons in a space. So we can give each unit or each artificial neuron a location in space, which is normally absent in artificial neural networks. Then we can calculate the distance between each pair of units, and we can penalize strong weights between distant units. So here we have a similar idea to what we saw previously, where we have part of the cost function dedicated to ensuring a good performance of the task. And we have the second part of the cost function, uh, the beta term tells us how to balance task performance versus the weighted distance of connections. And this J term penalizes these strong, particularly long distance connections. Uh, each connection leads to an increase in this penalty term according to the product of the weight, of the strength of the connection, multiplied by its distance. So this WI to J term is the weight, and the DI to J term is the distance between the neurons I and J. And we sum that up over all of the combinations of connections between all neurons I and J in the network. So now we can move on from the cost function to the learning rule. So you'll remember from a previous video that the backpropagation of error algorithm is often not considered biologically realistic for a few reasons. That includes that the weights going forward must equal to the weights going backwards. And the weight update depends on information, not just locally that a neuron would have, but also on information from distant neurons. And the network also acts and learns in two separate phases. So it forward propagates activity to perform the task, and it learns by backpropagating errors in two separate phases. Well, and you may recall that one proposed solution to the first problem was to use this technique called feedback alignment, where you let the feed forward weights be tradable, and you set the backward weights just to be random connections, and the network learns to approximately match the feed forward weights to the feedback weights, and therefore approximates the uh, backpropagation algorithm. We also touched briefly on the dendritic error model, and this model brings in some more features of neuroanatomy, including inhibitory neurons and neurons with dendrites. And when this network is at equilibrium, the neurons end up encoding the error terms in their dendrites. And the weights are updated according to a learning rate alpha, the firing rate input from the lower area, and the difference in voltage between the dendrite 
and the cell body. Uh, so this is all. So this is all information that is local and available to a single neuron. So this uh, helps deal with that second problem that we discussed. So a single neuron is used simultaneously for activity propagation in the feed forward direction, error encoding at the dendrites, and error and, pro and error propagation to the cell body without the need for a separate acting and learning phases. So that, that was some of the issues with backpropagation, but what about backpropagation through time, the, the version of backpropagation that's used to train recurrent neural networks? So again, it shares this problem of the weights going forward needing to be the same as the weights going backwards. But a problem with backpropagation through time that is unique is that the same neuron in the network must store and also retrieve with perfect accuracy the values of its activities from all points in the past. And it's not clear how a neuron could do that in the brain. So Murray in 2019, to deal with some of these issues with backpropagation through time, proposed the Random Feedback Local Online Learning Rule, or R-Flow. And the key part of this learning rule is that the change in the weight between two neurons, A and B, at a time t, depends on the learning rate and error, which is distributed in proportion to random weights. So this is exactly the same, and in fact inspired by the feedback alignment idea from Lillicrap and colleagues. And this is multiplied by a moving average of recent co-activations between neuron A and B. Uh, so this is like a slight variant on the Hebb's rule, and it only also relies on recent activations, which seems to be much more reasonable than the usual backpropagation through time algorithm, which needs to keep a measure of activations going very far back in time. So the strength of this algorithm is that it only depends on information that each neuron should have. It's local. There's no need to reuse weights in the forward and backward directions. And there's no need to, to run the activations backwards at the end of a trial to learn. However, a limitation is that these co-activations are forgotten at a rate determined by the neuronal time scale, which means that this uh, R-flow algorithm is very good for performing tasks that, are, that have trials that are relatively short and do not require a lot of memory. For tasks that are very long, it does underperform quite significantly backpropagation through time. Here we can see the loss over trials uh, for the R-flow algorithm in blue and backpropagation through time in red at these tasks that are short and long. And for this particular task, the networks had to replicate a certain input activity pattern over a short period of time or over a longer period of time. And you can see that both do extremely well over the short trial length, but our flow starts to break down over longer trials. So please turn to Blackboard and answer the quiz question. Which three components are specified by the designer in artificial networks? What is not specified by the designer? So that's the end of the video. Uh, so to recap, in NeuroAI, we aim to build models capable of performing complex tasks that are also able to make testable predictions for how the brain may solve the task. And when designing an artificial neural network to perform a task, the architecture, cost function, and learning rule are under our control. And we, should, we saw how sparse networks can be learned by using a mask or L1 regularization of the weights or also the activity. We saw how Dale's law can be implemented in artificial neural networks by rectifying the weights and multiplying by a diagonal matrix of one to minus ones. We can saw how we can penalize or avoid solutions with fi high firing rates by imposing L2 regularization on the activity. And we saw that we can discourage strong long distance connections by embedding each unit in a particular spatial position calculating the distance between these units and penalizing the product of the weight and the distance. We saw how biologically realistic and powerful learning is an area of ongoing research and some interesting suggestions for a way forward here include feedback alignment, dendritic error accumulation and random feedback local online learning. So if you want to dig deeper into any of these topics, I recommend these papers. Thank you.